In sports, we've seen a ton of hated players, but none of them come close to Marshall Henderson. Have you ever heard the phrase, menace to society? That's exactly what he was. I wouldn't label him as a villain, he was more of a cult hero, and we'll talk about that a little later in this video. I believe one of the most polarizing athletes of all time, especially in college football, was Johnny Manziel. We all remember, or you should remember, all the antics he was doing on the field and off the field. And well, to say the guy we're going to talk about in today's video was the college basketball version version of Johnny Manziel might just be an understatement. Yeah, that's right. You heard me correctly. It was that bad. How bad was it, you may ask? Let me just tell you some of his antics on and off the court. In just his first season of college basketball, at the end of a game, he got mad and punched a player on the court. I mean, I get it. I understand it. As a former athlete, we all get mad, but that doesn't give you a reason to punch people. Or how about this? He transferred from his first college after stating that his head coach was limiting him on offense, when in reality, he he shot over 300 shots that year, and he was second on the team in attempts. He taunted teams relentlessly. After beating Florida in the SEC Championship, he did the gator chomp to the fans, and after the game in an interview, he called the SEC coaches losers after not voting him to the first team All-SEC. Calling on the SEC coaches losers, I think it's safe to say this guy had some big balls on him. His most famous act on the court, and maybe some of you will remember this, after beating Auburn, the student section was flipping him off and he ran over to him after the game and just waved his jersey in their faces. Oh yeah, and how can I forget to mention that he also threw shots at Aaron Andrews and her boyfriend. That's just some of them and we got a lot more to talk about in this video. And oh yeah, we can't forget to mention that he was on probation for drugs throughout his entire career. It even got so bad and to the point where he got kicked off the team indefinitely. I know it sounds like a lot, but that is just a small part of this man's career and story. I don't know if we'll ever see somebody act this way again because for the most part, half of the stuff he was doing, it's not even allowed nowadays. Let me give you a better perspective of just how psychotic this man was. When most players are getting booed and called names on the court, they just try to block it out. But this man, when he was getting booed and called some terrible names on the court, he was literally pumping up the crowd. Although I thought it was crazy at the time, looking back on it, that's what made this guy so entertaining to watch. He definitely had NBA talent as well. He averaged over 20 points per game in college. The question wasn't, could he make it to the NBA? The real question was, could he stay out of trouble? After his college career, things got really, and I mean really, interesting. There's a lot of questions that people have, but the biggest and most notorious one that we're going to answer is what really happened to the most hated college basketball player of all time. Real quick, before we get into this video, we are super close to 175k subscribers. Let's see if we can gain 50 or 100 new ones out of this video. You know what? However many we gain from this video, I'll tell you in the next one. It's like a cool little game we do on this channel. Hopefully you guys enjoy. But if you don't like the content, you don't got to subscribe. It is what it is. Get you a snack. Get you some popcorn. It's going to be a good one. Hope you enjoy. Let's get into it. Marshall Henderson. I feel like a lot of people know the name, but you don't necessarily know the story. To get into his story, we gotta throw it all the way back to where things started, and I want to make this very clear. This isn't going to be one of those stories where it takes a while to build up and get interesting. It gets insane from the start. He played his high school basketball for L.D. Bell High School in Hearst, Texas, and his dad was his head coach. In his marvelous high school career, he scored 2,289 points. Not too bad. His stats his senior year, they weren't nothing unreal or unbelievable, but they were very solid. He averaged 25.8 points per game, 5.1 assists, 5 rebounds, and 3.5 and not 3.5, 3.8 steals. My bad, my bad. You may be impressed with the 25 points per game, but the most impressive stat out of all those is averaging almost 4 steals a game. That is a lot of steals, and I understand it's only high school basketball, but that's impressive. But whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Before he even got to college, before he even went to Utah, he was already getting in big trouble. When he was a senior in high school, him and one of his friends was arrested in Tarrant County, Texas. Why was he arrested? Because in reality, he committed two crimes. Crime number one is that he tried to use $800 of fake money to buy what was crime number two at the time, Mary Jane. And he didn't even try to do it once, he tried to do it twice. At the time, he was young, and as young people, we make mistakes, we grow. I've messed up a ton in my life, especially in high school, and I'm sure I'm going to mess up some more. I'm not going to criticize him too hard. He was a young kid making mistakes, and we've all 
all been there. Although we're not going to talk about that too much more now, it plays a major, let me repeat, a major factor in what happens later in this video. That incident that happened in high school would come back to bite him in the butt three to four years down the road. All I gotta say about that, stay tuned. Coming out of high school, according to ESPN, he had an 87 overall scout grade, but he wasn't even a three or two star recruit, he was a zero star. I did see some other knockoff recruiting sites with him as a two and three star, but you get the point, he wasn't a highly coveted recruit. He did have some notable offers, I'll read you off the top five schools. Utah, Bradley, Gonzaga, Marquette, and Notre Dame. Ultimately, after a long thought out and hard process, he decided to commit and sign with Utah. The main reason he went to Utah, and this is my humbled opinion, is because he knew he could play right away. You gotta understand and realize that this guy had a huge ego, so he wasn't going to be okay with going into a college and sitting the bench. And if you want me to be 100% honest, I'd have done the same thing. I don't understand and I never will understand why these high school stars go to these big time schools where they know they're not going to play at all. I'd have way more fun and I'd enjoy it more if I played for a mediocre team but I was a star player and I got to play a lot. That's just me though. Marshall Henderson would do exactly what I just talked about. He went to Utah and started 30 out of 31 games. Weirdly enough though, his his freshman season, his first season at Utah, would also be his last. Out of everything we're going to talk about in this video, this is one of the strangest parts. In that one season at Utah, he was pretty dang good. He only shot 37% from the overall field, but you got to understand and realize most of his shot attempts came beyond the three-point line. For example, and I want you to really pay attention to these stats, his three-point percentage was 33.5, which is really good, and he shot six and a half threes per game, but only 3.7 twos per game. When he did shoot regular two-pointers, he averaged 44%, and as a guard, that's average. When it was all said and done for the season, he averaged right at 11.8 points per game, one assist, and two and a half rebounds. He was the second leading scorer on the team, and also shot the ball the second most amount of times. I don't think some of you quite understand how rare that is. You don't see a guy who had a big role on a team and was going to be the star player in the next year leave that team. Because it's really hard to go to college and find your role on whatever team you do, and right when you do find your role, you up and leave. The big rumor going around back then was that he didn't like the coach and he was quote unquote holding him back. How true is that rumor? I don't know, but I also don't know why he leave the program. Marshall Henderson actually came out with his own statement about leaving and here's what he had to say. My decision to leave Utah is not related to basketball. I want to be closer to home. Coach Boylan's program also has certain rules and restrictions that I respect, but I don't feel they fit with my individualism. This is not about the coaches, the system, or the players. Going off of that quote alone, you can see why everybody was assuming that him and the coaching staff didn't get along. At the same time, it was also controversial because the head coach is letting you shoot nearly seven threes a game and letting you do whatever you want to do on the court. So how wouldn't y'all get along? To be fair, and I have to remind myself all throughout this video when recording, Recording it, we're not talking about a normal basketball player. This guy does some of the strangest things you'll ever see. I personally find that one really odd, and I couldn't find an athlete anywhere that would tell me if they were a star player as a freshman, they would leave and try to find a different school. He wound up transferring to Texas Tech, and remember, it's not nowadays. There's not this transfer portal nonsense where you can transfer and play right away. Back then, you had to sit one year. That's exactly what he did. From 2010 through 2011, he had to sit out. The only real trouble and controversy controversial mess he got in at Utah was late in a game against BYU where he punched an opposing player and got ejected. Not only did he get ejected, but he also got suspended for the next game. As a former athlete, and I'm sure some of you relate to this, we understand it. When you're in the heat of the moment, things happen. The guy he punched wasn't even mad about it, and he said this quote unquote, it was in the heat of the moment. I know that Marshall is a great competitor. It just happened. So I think we can all agree that wasn't too bad, but ladies and gentlemen, that right there was just a small, and I mean, a very small sample size of what was about to come. That was simply just a taste of Marshall Henderson that many people would become to hate in the years after. Here's one thing we need to keep up with though. Remember how we talked about earlier he got arrested as a senior in high school? Well in 2010 he got put on probation for two years. I've never been on probation but from what I understand as long as you don't violate it and you don't get in any more trouble you should be okay. Unfortunately for him he didn't really stay out of trouble. Let's talk about basketball. Basketball, though. Like we stated, he had to sit out for Texas Tech and he didn't get to play at all. So going into 2011, he was going to be back on the court. Weirdly enough, he didn't even play for Texas Tech. He wound up leaving the program after this big mess and scandal at Pat Knight. 
who was the head coach at the time he got fired. So late in 2011, he would announce that he's transferring to South Plains Juco College. At this Juco College, once again, that goes by the name of South Plains, he was phenomenal. I mean, what do you expect? If a guy's good at D1 level, he's going to be good at the Juco level. He led this team to a 36-0 record and averaged right at 19.6 points per game. His team won the NJCAA National Championship. He was the MVP of his conference, he was first team All-American, and he was also the player of the year in his division. This guy was balling and it was clear as day and evident that he was too good to be playing at that level. Once again though with Mr. Marshall Henderson, with the good, you're also gonna get the bad. When he was at South Plains in February of 2012, he got put in jail for 25 days. He actually got sentenced up to four months in jail by the judge, and if you're wondering why, do you remember what happened his senior year, how he got in trouble and put on probation? Yeah, I think you know where we're going with this. He violated his probation. I'm all about second chances, but if you know you're on probation and you know you gotta be on your best behavior, how can I excuse this? It's beyond me how some people think and operate, and with that, this guy is a star basketball player. To go more into details, he violated his probation after testing positive for Mary Jane, alcohol, and cocaine. Let me make this clear, I don't care if you're a basketball star or a regular person. There's no excuse for you to be doing those type of things. I'm not really concerned about the Mary Jane and alcohol, but when you start mentioning cocaine, and I'm sure he was doing some other type of drugs, that's when it gets serious. Like I stated, he only went to jail for 25 days and he got put out on a seven weeks work release. I don't sugarcoat things and there's not another way to say this. That simply can't happen. I'm gonna emphasize this all throughout the video. This isn't a guy who's averaging five points per game and is a role player. We are talking about a guy who at the time had the potential to get to the NBA. Whether you like it or not, if you're an NBA talent at the high school or college level, you're held to a different standard. One of my favorite quotes of all time, and I got it hung up in my house, is that with great power comes great responsibility. If you wanna be a star athlete and have all this power, there's a lot of responsibilities that come with it. And ladies and gentlemen, I just gotta be honest, I don't think it's too hard to not do drugs. I haven't even brought this up, and this might be the biggest part about all of it, is that he was also trying to get his reputation back and get back up to D1 basketball. I'm gonna look at it from a coaching perspective. Let's say I was watching him at South Plains and I'm a head coach at Florida and I'm like, man, I might recruit this guy and then it comes out he's doing all these terrible drugs. I don't think I'd recruit him anymore. I just gotta be honest. I've said it in two different videos in the past week. Your best ability is availability. With Marshall Henderson, yeah, we knew he was a phenomenal talent and he's gonna give you 20 a night, but you also didn't know if he was gonna be strung out on drugs and if he'd be suspended for the entire season. Somehow, someway, I till this day don't know how and why it happened, but Ole Miss offered him and he committed and signed. And now here's where things really start to get interesting. We are to the point in time in this story where I'm sure some of you watching this, you're starting to remember who Marshall Henderson is and was. The stuff we talked about earlier in this video, nobody really knows all that, but the Ole Miss days is when his career and his antics were brought to life. Why were they brought to life? Because number one, Ole Miss is a D1 and a big time D1 school. And number two, he was just acting crazy. Don't get me wrong, not crazy in a bad way. It was a good crazy. It was entertaining. The best way to describe it is if I was coming home from school or trying to catch his games on a Saturday, I would find myself sitting there going, man, what time does Ole Miss play? I gotta see what he does. You was getting the best of both worlds with Marshall Henderson. You knew he was gonna go off for 15 to 30 points, but you also knew he might do something insane. He might flip off a fan, he might fight a fan, he might get cussed out, he may get thrown out of the game, you just didn't know. No player is doing that nowadays, and really, in reality, I don't think no coach would allow that behavior. His first year at Ole Miss, which would now be his junior year of college basketball, was 2012 through 13. I don't want to overcomplicate this. He was a hooper. He was really good at basketball. I know that may sound corny, but he was just that guy that had God-given talent and abilities. In 36 games for Ole Miss, he started 32 of them and averaged almost 32 minutes per game. On two-pointers, he shot 46%, and on his threes, he shot 35%, and that's respectable. Considering how many shots per game he was taking, shooting 35% behind the arc is really good. He was shooting, and you are seeing and hearing this correctly, 
10.9 threes per game and he was making 3.8. He had the green light and he was more of a shooter and a player you'd see nowadays. Nobody back then was pulling up five or 10 feet behind the three point line, but he was. In that first year for Ole Miss, he averaged a whopping 20 points per game. Seems and sounds good on paper, but remember, like I said, with Marshall Henderson, you get the good, but you also get the bad. In January of that season in 2012, after beating Auburn, he would go in front of the student section and do one of the most infamous things of all time. I remember seeing this live. It looked like a movie scene. You had everyone cussing him out and flipping him off, and he was sitting there pampering his jersey in their faces. Is pampering the right word? I don't know, but you get the point. He was showboating, and it looks like something you do in your room or imagine you do in a dream, but not really do it in a game. But check this out. Only three days later after that Auburn incident, him and a Kentucky fan was throwing ice at each other. In that game, Ole Miss, I think was the favorite at the time and they were supposed to win. Henderson didn't play that good. He had 21 points, but was only two for 11 on threes. Ole Miss did lose the game 87 to 74, but the biggest takeaway was that Marshall Henderson and a fan was throwing ice at each other. That right there is exactly what I'm talking about. It didn't matter if it was a weekday or a Saturday night. You wanted to clear your schedule to make time to see this man play. My favorite story and my favorite Marshall Henderson moment from that season was not too long after in March of the SEC tournament in 2013. I'm not going to talk about the game too much because who cares? We're not here about the gameplay. We're here to see what this man does off the court. Ole Miss beat Florida 66-63 and won the SEC championship, and that was awesome. But what caught everybody's attention is what happened after in the interviews. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. How can I forget to mention is that after the game when they beat Florida, he was running around the arena doing the gator chomp to the fans. Come on now, how can you even hate on him? That's awesome. I think the two biggest F you things you can do to any fan base is for Texas, throw the horns down, and for Gators to do the gator chomp. I want you to take some time to imagine this. You got an arena full of Florida fans who is cussing out a guy saying terrible things and while they're yelling at him and flipping him off, he's running around the arena doing the gator chomp with the biggest smile on his face. That's why I don't think he's a villain, because villains, nobody really likes them. But if you are an Ole Miss fan, you love this guy. The perfect label for him is a cult hero. That's what he was. He had a cult behind him of Ole Miss fans. And maybe he's not just the most hated player of all time. He might be the most polarizing athlete we've ever seen. There wasn't a debate of, oh yeah, Marshall Henderson, he's all right. You either hated this guy or you loved him. No in-betweens. When all that mess settled down after the game in the interviews, it got even more interesting. To get into the interview story, it actually started before that because the coaches didn't even vote him to the first team All-SEC. That might be one of the biggest snubs of all time. He was on one of the best teams in the SEC, and he was also one of the leading scorers. So how in the heck was he not first team All-SEC? I'll answer that question, because everyone hated him. In the interview, he was asked about it, and he called all the coaches in the SEC losers. Here's my takeaway from that. Is he really cocky? I don't think so. Cocky's when you're overconfident. He could back up everything he said. Henderson was an old school trash talker who relished the opportunity for people to root against him. He absolutely loved the fact that a lot of people wanted him to fail and he could prove them wrong every single game. I think he enjoyed playing more on the road than he did at home just so he could troll fans. After the SEC tournament, they would then go to the NCAA tournament where it got even more intriguing. In the tournament, Ole Miss would match up with LaSalle where they did lose the game, but you know Marshall Henderson, he was still going to create waves and create storylines. In this game, after hitting a three-pointer, when he was running down the court, he acted like he was smoking something. Oh man, oh man, some of the things he did, it really left you scratching your head. If he didn't have a prior history of smoking stuff and getting caught and being on probation, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But the fact that you were on probation for the things that you were acting like you were doing in the game, it is a big deal. To make matters even worse, after they lost the game and he was leaving the court, he was kicking over water bottles and flipping over trash cans, and he also flipped off the crowd. When he was asked why he did this, he said, someone yelled that my sister is a W-H-O-R-E and said something about cocaine. Did that happen? Sure. I mean, it happened every single game he was at. You just still can't do those things. You can't flip off fans and kick over water bottles. The NCAA got a lot of heat for this and a lot of people couldn't believe and they were saying, 
oh, how do you allow your players to act this way? And here's what they came out and said. Quote unquote, a point of emphasis with the committee over the last several years continues to be ensuring that championship participants, Marshall Henderson, act in a manner that represents the high standards of sportsmanship. Mr. Henderson's actions failed in this regard. That statement was released by the NCAA on June 26, in 2013. Why is that important? Because not too long after, on July 10th in 2013, Ole Miss suspended Marshall Henderson indefinitely. The reason they suspended him? What do you know? You probably would have never guessed it. For drugs. You would think they wouldn't let him back on the team. That's his what? Second or third offense? Some people out there thought this was the end of Marshall Henderson's career, at least at Ole Miss. Once again though, somehow, some magical way, Ole Miss gave him another chance. They did allow him to come back for his final and senior year, which was 2013 through 14. He did miss his first three games, and he didn't have as many problems or altercations throughout his senior year. There was a lot of speculation, and you don't gotta be a rocket scientist to figure out, that the main reason he didn't have a lot of these altercations is that Ole Miss was saying, hey, you mess up one time, and you're gone for good. Let me know in the comment section, but I think that's why he was acting on his best behavior. Even though he was on his best behavior, Henderson's best behavior was worse than most people's normal behavior. His senior year, if you go off of the stats, it was close to his junior year, almost a carbon and copy paste. He shot 39% on two pointers and 34% on threes and averaged 19 points per game. One of the only controversies that happened that year is that him and a fan at Penn State, or a couple of fans, they were heckling him, going back and forth, but that's pretty much it. He was still getting buckets, he was averaging 19 points per game. He just wasn't as entertaining as the year before. With his college career coming close to an end, I'm gonna tell you right now, his story's not even close to being over. The biggest question everybody had about Henderson is was he good enough to go to the NBA? When you take a look at his film and you look at his numbers that he produced at the D1 and collegiate level, you're like, yeah, he is good enough. I'm not saying he'd be a first round pick, but he could possibly be a 45th to 60 overall pick. I'd say maybe possibly a late second rounder. But here's the biggest thing, and I want my younger athletes to pay attention to this, because you never know, you could be in this position. You may not think what you do off the court affects how you're evaluated on the court, but it does. I'm gonna make this short and sweet. He wasn't worth the risk. Maybe if he was in the LeBron James category and had all these drug problems, yeah, you might risk an NBA pick with him. But the fact that he was a, you know, iffy NBA player at that and he had these problems, not even a chance. He really kind of shot himself in the foot with that one and it's nobody's fault but his. He did declare for the 2014 NBA draft, but you know where this is going, he went undrafted. After going undrafted, he would get a tryout with an Italian team and he did sign with them. He would go from team to team and bounce back and forth, you know how that goes. During that same year in 2014, he would sign with an A-Rub team and he was the MVP. The team he signed for goes by the name of Al Reagan, hope I'm saying that correctly, and he averaged 17 points per game and five and a half rebounds. Right there you see it, he is a consistent 20 points a night type of guy ever since high school. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say this, if he would have had a non-trouble and problematic career at the collegiate level, he could have been a guy in the NBA who was a role player who just sat in the corner and shot threes. You can believe what you want, but the best ability in basketball is the ability to shoot the ball. If you can shoot the basketball and score the basketball, there's gonna be a spot for you, especially in 2022. Anyways, getting back on topic, after his MVP season with the Arabian team, in mid-February of 2015, he signed a $10,000 per month contract with a new team in Iraq. In 2015, though, the trolling that he was doing in college, it came back. Remember how he got suspended in 2013? Well, at the time, Aaron Andrews, who worked for ESPN, was taking some shots at him. It's funny how the tables turn, and it's also funny how people remember stuff like that. In the year of 2013, when Aaron Andrews was attacking him about it, he didn't say a word. But fast forward in time to 2015, her boyfriend was caught with drugs. Aaron Andrews' boyfriend was arrested in Las Vegas after being suspected with having cocaine. He was put into jail and was posted on a $5,000 bail, and while Marshall Henderson was playing in Iraq, here's what he had to say. I can't even believe he remembered this, but it goes to show you that people don't forget stuff. He tweeted out, at Aaron Andrews dot 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 dot, 
LOL, what's up with your boyfriend? Woo, this man, Marshall Henderson, is a menace, actually not just a menace, a certified menace to society. I don't even know what to say about that. Let's just get back on with his basketball career. Man, this guy's had a crazy life story. He went from playing for like three or four different college teams to hooping in Iraq. Shortly after that stint with them, in September of 2015, he signed with the Sacramento Kings. So at that time, everybody's like, hey, maybe he's got a chance, but he was waived in October. After getting waived in October of 2015, in November, only a month after, he was playing in the NBA D-League. Sadly, that didn't last too long because he was waived. Fast forward to October in 2016, he would sign with a new team back in Italy. He didn't stay with them too long, and officially in April of 2017, he retired. Or I don't even know if it was retired, he just kind of quit playing. I'm not too sure if there's a label on it. After retiring, or whatever you want to call it, in 2018, he began his coaching career. He started out back where he grew up in Birdville High School in Texas. He didn't coach that high school team for long because in 2019, he was an assistant coach at Thomas University. But then what? What do you know, in 2020, he made his infamous return back to Ole Miss as a graduate manager. That was pretty cool how he ended back up at Ole Miss. As to when I'm currently speaking, though, he is now an assistant coach at Independence Community College in Kansas. Wow, that's all I gotta say. What a career and what a life story. If you want me to be completely honest, I try to do recaps, but it's hard to even recap this. It's overwhelming. There's so much that went on. I'm just gonna leave it at this. I wonder if he wouldn't have gotten in all that trouble if he would have made it to the NBA. I don't know. I'm very curious. Let me know your thoughts down below. But with that being said, it's gonna wrap up this video. If you enjoyed this, I'd appreciate it if you joined our channel hit that subscribe button leave a like do that nice stuff yeah hope you guys enjoyed i'm out y'all peace